Amen. If you would open up your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27 is where we're going to begin tonight. Brent, it makes sense now. You know, being led by the Holy Spirit is a difficult thing, isn't it? Because that means you have to have faith. That means you have to be willing to do some things you normally wouldn't do, doesn't it? Now, tonight we're going to talk about... I had planned Joshua and some different things, but we're going to go back. I was sitting over there in that seat this morning, and uh, Pastor Mike was preaching. And uh, he got, and he, he was preaching chapter 7, um, verses what we're fixing to read here, building your house upon the rock. And it was like, God spoke to me and said, that's what you're going to preach tonight. I was like, God, but I've been working on something else all week. <laughs> if you know me, I'm a scheduled guy. I like it to be routine, right? But God said, you're going to speak on it. And I said, well, we'll see. <laughs> so I got in my office and prayed, and God said, no, I want you to go this direction. So that's where we're going to go. If you'd stand with me, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to continue our last installment, Living Greater, Expecting More. If you missed this morning with Pastor Mike, trust me, you do not want to miss it. Go find it online. It'll be well worth your time. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine, does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And we know that rock is Jesus Christ. Amen? And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who's built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. We want to be on the rock, don't we? Father, our hearts are bowed to you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us tonight, illuminate our hearts, God, go into the parts and the places that only you can go into. And Father, we pray that our life would be enlightened unto you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, everyone says, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Welcome. We are glad you're here tonight. I won't keep you too long here. Um, as, I read this, as I read this scripture, there's a couple things that is in my heart that I want you guys to know that it reinforces. And if you're new with us tonight, we want to say, hey, welcome guests. We love you. We are so glad that you're here as we see these multiple families. Trust me, our heart is pointed towards you. First of things, as I read the scripture, there's a couple things that really jump out and get me. Because as we read that, Christ actually ends that section as he ends chapter 7. It says this, that he spoke with so much authority when he spoke to those crowds that they were astonished at it. Because he got up like he knew what he's talking about, you know. He didn't know what he was talking about because so-and-so told him that he knew what he was talking about. He knew what he was talking about because he's the son of the living God. So as we read his words, that's the reason why he's saying, listen, if you do what I tell you to do, you're going to be good. If you don't do what I tell you to do, not good. And that's the simplest way to put it. And here, but he helps us, he reinforces some things in Scripture because we wonder, once I become saved, once I give my heart to God, it's like Disney World. You know, da, 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 you know, everything's a musical. It's not true, is it? And always it becomes more rough. But this is the difference. During the roughness, I'm not by myself. I have the peace of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with me, knowing that I'm going to make it through. This is the first thing that I see is that storms happen to everyone. If we read the te- as we read the text, we know that it doesn't matter whether people built their house upon the rock of Jesus Christ or built their house upon the sand. Evil happens to the just and unjust is what the Word of God says, doesn't it? So if you're in here and you feel like you're going through a storm, am I the only one doing this? Is, am I doing this because I'm a Christian or because I'm not a Christian? No. Sometimes it's just because everybody faces the storm from time to time. But it's Christ that gets us through the storm. He is the wind in our sails. Man, we would be dead on the water, wouldn't we, without him? Yeah. Another thing that I see is some things are out of our control. Bad things happen and you've done everything good. Right? You haven't done much wrong, or you haven't tried to do much wrong. Everybody not tried to do anything wrong, and then it still turned out wrong, you know? (laughs) Some things are just out of our control. We don't control the weather. We don't control the wind and the rains and all this stuff and the the winds that howl. We can't control that. Some things are just out of our control. So if you're sitting here and thinking, it's just out of my control, welcome to the club. Because there's sometimes we look at our life and say, God, it's out of my control. But what it's not out of is His control. But you've got to be with Him So it's in his control. Amen? Okay? Next thing that I see here is we can choose Christ or reject Christ. So in the text, as we read it, it says, listen, you have a choice. You can either build upon the sand, which is not the word of God, which is not Jesus Christ, which is the things of the world, material things that we see, and emotions and feelings, which we always, we all of us have feelings, right? Or he said, listen, you could build upon the rock, Jesus Christ. He said, you could build your house upon me. 
And everybody has that decision. Either we're going to accept Christ into our heart and He becomes our Lord and Savior and we build our house upon Him, or we don't. But we all have that choice. And if we want to be able to walk in His goodness and His grace, we have to build our house on the rock, on Jesus. Amen? Another thing that I see is Christians will walk through difficult times. So if you're a Christian in the house, just know you're not alone. We will walk through difficult times. Okay? And I know I mentioned that kind of before, but it's really important because it's not just a sing and a dance and a song when you're a Christian. Amen? There's some difficulty in it. There's some stuff. In some ways, it becomes a little bit more difficult because you've got to push the things of the world away from you because now it seems like sin kind of has a gravitational pull, doesn't it? It's kind of like the black hole, kind of like, oh, it'll suck you in, huh? That's what Hebrew says, that it's good for a season. But when that season's over, it is not good, Right? Now, the good thing is, is, like we sang about it, it's amazing grace. We have the grace of God in our life that will pull us back to Him. Yeah. Doesn't mean we'll escape the consequences. Can I get an amen? amen? But we can, with the help of Jesus Christ, back Him. And as we look at this, we see some very important things in here. And we see some very important things that we, we have limits and limitations. And, you know, Christ doesn't have any limits or limitations, does He? The year is 1996. A, a group of 10 mountain climbers are climbing Mount Everest. Now, Mount Everest is like the holy grail of mountain climbing, right? If you can make it up to the pinnacle, I mean, you have a story for a lifetime. You can probably write a book and get away with it if you make it. But this is the theory. If you don't make it to the peak where you start at, because you know you can't climb it all in one day, right? So it's like you climb to here, then you climb to here, then you climb to here. But they're at the section that's the final section, and this is the deal, okay? You've got to make it to the top by 2 p.m. If you don't make it to the top by 2 p.m., it's agreed that everybody turns around and goes back because it's too dangerous. A group of 10 hikers, man, they're huffing and puffing, and they're using all their supplies and doing everything that they can, and they're almost to the peak of the mountain. Ding dong, ding dong, the clock strikes two. They have a choice to make. What they choose to do is they're going to push past and go on up to the top of the mountain. What they didn't know is a blizzard was just about to settle in on them, and when they did make it up to the top, that blizzard settled in. Unfortunately, only two of the ten came back down the mountain to tell that they got to the top. What does that show us? That we all have limitations. They got to the top and they ran out of auction, they ran out of supplies, they ran out of some different stuff that they needed. Whenever we're trying to do it by ourselves, we're going to run out of supplies. We're very limited. But if we will let Christ help us, He's unlimited. He's the unlimited resource. He's the one that has an emotional bank that's full, that has a material bank that's full, that has a blessing bank that's full, amen? And at the moment that we don't feel like we can push any past any further, we feel like the snowstorms are coming. If we're trying to do it ourselves, we have limitations and we won't be able to make it. Oh, but if we rely on Jesus Christ and build our house upon that rock, amen, we know that we can make it. Every one of us has limitations. It's not because you're unsaved or maybe anything like that or even because you're, you're a new Christian or maybe an immature Christian or however you want to do those labels. That's not what it is. We all have limitations. That's the reason why we must lean into the Holy Spirit and lean into Christ and say, listen, help me with these limitations. Help me with these things that I understand. I've got choices to make and I can't make them alone. The good happens to the good and the bad. The bad happens to the good and to the bad or the just and the righteous or the unjust. It happens to us. But once we found in Christ, we move, have that peace that whatever we see, whatever we're going through, we have Him on our side. Amen. And we all have that choice. And we all need Him because we're limited by different factors. And let me tell you this, what God wants to do in your life, you cannot accomplish on your own. You have to have Christ on your side. The lives that He wants to change through us, the lives that He wants to encourage, the lives that He wants to build up, your homes that He wants to strengthen. If, if you could have already done it, you had already done it. You're good-hearted people. But we can't do it alone, can we? We have to have Christ. And if you're in that situation like I was, oh man, I know for me, several years ago, I came down, I've, I've tried it all on my own, God. He said, I know, that's the reason why you need to be at the altar, invite me into your heart. <laughs> And when I did that, I realized I wasn't alone, amen, that I had Christ on my side. But we all have limitations and we all have these things. But if we're going to be like the wise men, if we're going to say, listen, I want to be like the wise men, I want to build my house on the rock. What are some things in our life that we know that people who build their house on the rock does? Well, we've already established the first one. The very first one is we know that we have to have Christ in our life, right? He is the rock. 
So it's about salvation. And what that looks like is this, Christ, I need you in my heart and my life. Now let me, let, me, let me make sure we all understand this. It's not enough to know, is it? Satan could quote scripture to Jesus. Salvation is whenever Jesus has the lordship over our life. That means I am no longer my own landlord. I have evicted myself and invited Christ into my life. Paul puts it like this, which I've said a hundred times. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the very first step. But if we're going to be like that wise man, we see that that is the beginning. I choose to build my house upon the rock. My life from now on is being built. But the first thing that we see as we go past that is we have to have an act of faith, don't we? We have to have an act of faith. Verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine. Verse 26 again, he says, for everyone who hears these words of mine. One does them, one does not do them. The one that does not do them builds his house upon the sand. The one who does do it says, no, I'm going to build my house upon the rock. I'm going to take the extra effort that I need to to set that foundation and let God be my foundation. So how do we hear from God? So how does our faith really be active? Well, A, let me, let me encourage you. Share your faith with somebody. If you're saved, go out and tell somebody, man, Jesus Christ is alive, and he can be alive in you just like he's alive in me. You know, that's not something just we, we teach in the Sunday school halls for our children and for our youth, is it? All of us, man, can carry that torch that Christ is alive, and he will change your life if you'll let him. Amen? But we, we let that permeate. So, so we take that active faith and we do things. We, we try to hear from God to be active. You've got to hear from God. If you've ever done a workout, you know, you've turned on the, the um, computer or you have a coach, you know. I had a coach in high school, and this is what he said to me. He said, Matt, if I ever quit yelling at you, that means I don't like you. I went home and told my dad, I said, I think my football coach wants to marry me because that dude's always yelling at <laughs> me. So, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Now, this is the thing. But to be active, right? Go to this position, do this. We have to be willing to hear. That's the reason why he says you've got to be willing to hear and do. So we have to have an active faith. Well, how do, we, how do we hear and do? Well, we do the simple things. We read the Bible. And this is the amazing thing about the Bible. This is why we want to read it, right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and spirits, the joints and the marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You're sitting in service tonight, or you sit in other service, and you're thinking, why do I feel this way in my, why do I feel this way in my heart? It's because the word of God's being preached, and it's sharper than two, any two-edged sword, and it pierces our soul. Then it says, hey, man, you can do better. I want to encourage you. Or it might say this and say, listen, you need to get your heart right, because there's going to be one day that you're going to meet me. you got to have your heart right. So we read our word to build up our faith as Christians. We, we build up our hearts so we know when to repent. We know when to go forward. We know when to pull back. We know when to do these things. Then we listen to the Spirit of God. How many of us believe that the Spirit of God still moves? Can I get an amen? Yeah, that's not a weird thing, is it? No, the Spirit of God moves and speaks to us and, and loves us so much. And this is what Scripture says. Jesus is talking, John 16, verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, which he already has, amen, Acts chapter 1 and 2. The spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. If you're struggling for truth in your life and you turn on the news and you don't know what to do, you read books and you don't know what to do, you read newspapers or magazines or you listen to podcasts and say, I can't find any truth. Well, you know where you can find truth at? The word of God and listen to the spirit of God because he is in all truth. So he will guide us into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare you all things that are to come. You got some things that you don't know what's happening? Lean into the Spirit of God and let him guide you. And also prayer. Do the simple things. How do we hear from God? We read the Bible, we listen to the Spirit of God, and then we pray. Amen? John Wesley, one of the founders of the Methodist Church, and the Methodist Church looked way different back then than it does today. But this is what he said about prayer. He said, the grand means of drawing near to God. It's really prayer. Some of you guys have experienced that this week. You know, John Wesley would pray at least two hours a day. You might be thinking, Matt, I don't know what to pray about. What, what do I pray about? How does that look? Well, we've all been there. I remember my first prayer, you know, God bless me, bless the trees, bless the birds and the bees. You know what I mean? And I was like 14. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I might have been a little bit younger. But you guys know what I mean. You don't always know how to pray. This is what Philippians says. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer. So you know what you're supposed to pray about? Everything. 
You got a new job coming your way? Pray about it. You got something happening in your family? Pray about it. You want to change something in your life? Pray about it. You're thinking about investing in something? Pray about it. You're thinking about a new relationship? Pray about it. In everything, pray to God. He simplifies it for us. It's not some big mystery that we have to. But now prayer works to the believer, doesn't it? To the one who has Christ living in our heart. If you're thinking, man, I've prayed a thousand times. I don't know why it's working. I go back to the basic question of this. Is Christ alive in your heart? Because if he has the residency in your heart, then you have access to him and he answers prayers. Amen? Now, maybe not as quick as we want to and always like we want to, but we have. But that's how we have that active faith and we build that routine. Just build a routine, not a rut. Build a routine. You know, you have that place in your house that you sit down and you pray and you do those things. I have friends in my life, they go out on prayer jogs and prayer walks. We listen to podcasts. Sometimes I go out and I build stuff, which I'm not very good at. Turns out I'm not a carpenter. I need to stick with preaching. But, but when I'm out there hammering nails or doing something like that, I'm listening to podcasts and just praying and asking God to touch you guys and touch my family. And you guys all have that. But what are those staples in your life that you do? Build in those staples. Build in those routines. Have that active faith. That place where you can share your faith. As we continue to read here, we see something else that's very important. Build to the plans. Build to the plans. Many times we build to our own plans, don't we? Now, let me explain this. How many of you guys know what a cosigner is? Okay. So a cosigner is this. I can't cover the cost, so in case things go south, you're cosigning for me and you got it. This is how we are in prayer sometimes. God, I don't want you to be my leader. I want you to be my cosigner. I've already developed this rhythm in my mind and plans of how I want things to go. So now I'm going to go into prayer and just ask you to check off on it and say it's okay. And the problem with that is Jesus is not a genie in a bottle, baby. You guys know that song? No, okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's not, right? That's not how it works. We build our plans off of His plans. So if you go on a construction crew, this is how it is. If you go on a construction crew, I called my friend Jack Bishop today. I said, I want to understand this. He said, listen, Matt. He said, on a construction crew, there's a foreman. Now, if you're going to be part of the building, you need to go into the foreman and ask them how to do it. And he said, this is the foreman's responsibility to make sure that the plans of the leads, like the one who leads in trim, the one who leads in plumbing or electricity, or the one who frames, those leaders, that their plans fit into the major plans. See, every one of us are leaders in some sort of form and capacity. And at the barest form, if you have a family, you help lead your family. But you've got to make sure that those plans fit in the overall plans of God. And guess what? We're not the foreman, are we? Christ is the foreman. He's our rock. So when we, yes, because when, so when we go into his, his courts, if you will, Go in there and we say, God, what are your plans? Help me build on those plans. And this is the great thing. As we grow and we strengthen in Christ, we'll want to build on those plans more, more, and more, won't we? Because the more we know Christ, the more we know that he's right and we're wrong. <laughs> the more we know that his way is the right way. And it won't seem right. Pastor preached that it won't seem right because it says, narrow is the gate. Narrow is the way, but straight is the path. So you're looking at it, you're like, this doesn't make sense to me. A lot of times it won't, but we have to lean into what Christ says. We have to lean into his Holy Spirit and say, help me. And we've got to build with his plans. And it doesn't matter where you jump in. You can start in and jump anywhere that you need to. The year is June 1944. It's June 19th, 1944. President Franklin D. Roosevelt makes his famous speech. His famous speech that says this, Grant us a common faith that man shall know bread and peace that he shall know justice and righteousness. It's the height of World War II. Just a year before this, in December, poor Harbor has been attacked, and it looks bleak. And we're, poured in, we're pulled into the war. Then all of a sudden, we see the leader of our country lean on one thing, because at the end of that address, this is what he says, I'm going to say a prayer now that was presented to the United Nations. If you'd have looked at our country, you would have been like, man, I, I don't understand this. I mean, we're just coming out of the Great Depression. There's some things going on, and all of a sudden now we're into a war. But what I found is all those leaders in those times of catastrophic events happening, devastation, they didn't lean on themselves. They leaned into God. Even when those leaders didn't really know that they were doing it. Because like Franklin D. Roosevelt, he had some issues in his life that were not godly. Like girlfriends and stuff, you know, and being married, that's never a good thing, okay? It's not biblical. 
But he leaned in. He knew to reach to the faith of the Christians and say, let's build that faith up and say these prayers. And I just want to let you know it's not too late. It may be difficult at your home. It may be difficult in your life. And you say, but Matt, you don't understand. I've done some things wrong. I haven't been the father or the mother. I haven't been where I needed to be and done what I've needed to do. Listen, that God wants to come down right in the middle of your plans and help you out. But we've just got to switch to his plans, which is ultimately the plan of salvation. And then that begins building on the rock. And then from that, you begin to learn about Christ's plans and say, show me your plans. And this is the third thing that I see. We've got to live ready. You know, this is one thing that's not always preached, but Christ is coming back, isn't he? He really is. We believe in the rapture that Christ one day will come back, and it could be at any time. And I don't mean that as fearful. We mean that as excitement because one day we're out of here. Whether we meet here or we meet in the air, we're going to be with Jesus Christ. So it's going to be good. And we got to live ready. we got to be on alert. See, this is what the Scripture says. The rain came, the wind blew, the floods came. They beat against the house. It happens to the just and the unjust, so we have to live alert. We have to be ready. We have to know what God is trying to do in our life. Mountain climbers have one thing that they face that not a whole lot of people face. It's called hypoxia. Hypoxia is something that sets in as they climb the mountain and they go higher and higher and they begin to run out of oxygen. They begin to get in trouble. Dizziness sets in, fatigue, mental things. And the last thing you want to do is be on the side of a rock mountain getting dizzy. You know what I mean? But what happens is they begin to run out of oxygen. Acts chapter 17 verse 28 says this. It's in Christ that we live, we move, and we breathe. In him we have our being. So when we're away from Christ, we cut the oxygen supply off of our life. And we're in a place that seems hopeless, that seems destitute. But once we get back into Christ or we accept Christ and we let him change our life, now all of a sudden we've got that lifeblood back in us, don't we? The Holy Spirit can speak to us and, and do things in our life that we really need. And it might seem like you're on a thousand foot wall and Just things aren't working out. You don't know my marriage. You don't know the decisions. You don't know the troubles. You don't know the things. You're right, I don't. But what I do know is Christ knows and he cares. And he's limitless and he can do things. He can reach into your life where you're at, help show you things. This last week we had prayer and fasting at our church and my daughter Callie partook upon it. She's not in here, so I'm going to tell on her. She decided, she said, Dad, I want to fast sweets. I want to fast all refined sugars, is how I put it. So every time she, she wanted a sugar, it would jar something in her, and she'd be reminded to pray for the things that she had written down and prayed for. And we told her on the way back. I, I told her this. I said, we're driving back, and we're talking about the fast for a little while. I said, Callie, I said, I don't want you fasting because you're a pastor's daughter. I don't want you fasting because you think you have to. Your mother and I have chosen this life, and that's the reason why we fast. She chimed up in the back seat, looked over, or, or chimed up over the back seat and said, Dad, I've chosen this life too. Amen. Amen. Yes. Now, this is the thing. You talk about, like, piercing. Like, okay, let's talk about fasting then. We began to talk about fasting, and we were talking to her. We said, now listen, whatever you fast, know that you're going to be offered it more times this week than you ever have in your entire life. <laughs> so she goes back to school Tuesday. She goes, man, my friend came up to me and had popcorn. Now at my house, I don't know about y'all's house, but we eat popcorn like six times a week, right? She said, but it was covered in Reese's peanut butter cup. <laughs> oh, yes, dude. She said, Dad, I had my hand in the bag, and it hit me. She had to look at her friend and say, hey, no, thank you. I appreciate it. She began to pray. And I was praying as I fasted. I had a goal in my mind, but I was praying, and I said, God, what do you want me to do? And he brought me back to that conversation that I had with her earlier. See, I was praying with her many times ago. I'm just being vulnerable with you because you make mistakes. I was praying with her and teaching her how to pray. And she would pray, and then I would follow up with a prayer. She looked at me one time and said, Dad, whenever you do that, it makes me feel like my prayers are not, in, or it makes me feel like my prayers are insignificant. Mm. I was praying in my office this last week, God, how long do you want me to fast? How long do you want me to pray? You know, what do you want me to do? And he reminded me of that conversation. He said, you started the fast as a family, 
and I want you to break it as a family. And I didn't necessarily want to do that because I already had a goal in my mindset. But I went back to Callie and I said, listen, whenever you're done, I'm done. It'll be okay. She decided to break her fast Thursday evening, I believe. We sat down, and of course, it's a, it's a big deal that we're learning. You know, we sat down, and we, we ate together, and we prayed over everything that we'd been praying about. And God, as we break this, we know that you've worked stuff in the spiritual realm and things like that, because it says training a child up in the way, right? And she's sitting on the couch, and she looks over at me, and she says this. She goes, Dad, I'm glad you broke your fat. And she didn't know that I'd, I'd had this conversation with God. Only Mary did. She said, Dad, I'm glad you broke your fast when I did because it didn't make me feel guilty. What she was saying is it made me feel like what I did mattered too. See, I, I wouldn't have known that without the Holy Spirit working in my life. But I don't have the Holy Spirit working in my life without Christ being in my life. And I don't have Christ without, in my life without saying, I'm going to build my house upon the rock. And let me tell you guys, and you guys know this, we can't do it alone, can we? We've got to have Christ in our life. We've got to have the God of the Holy Spirit. We've got to have each other, don't we? And I want you to know we're here for you. If you haven't made that choice to have Christ in your heart, we are here for you. The Holy Spirit wants to lead and guide and direct you. And I want you to know there's a whole bunch of people in this church in the sanctuary that will show you, that will help you, that will lead you. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love and your goodness. We just celebrate tonight and everything that's happened. What a wonderful statement, God, that was made tonight from so many people. I said, tonight is the open confession that I follow you with all of my heart, Christ. And Father, as we celebrate that, we also ask if there be anybody in the house that doesn't know you, that tonight, God, their heart would be turned towards you. As a loving and gracious God that draws us unto you, that causes us to be at that fork in the road, that we have to choose you and be led by you. And as people may wrestle with that in the spirit, God, I pray that they would willingly give themselves to you. For my brothers and sisters who are in the house tonight, God, that know you, that love you, I just pray, God, that our faith is active, that our plans are under your plans, and that, God, that we're alert and we're ready not only for you to use us, but the, for the things to come. Because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The rains, rains come, the winds blow. It's going to come. The storm is on its way. But when we're founded on you, we know that we can have peace and goodness. We love you. Would you stand up with me all over? Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is kind of, kind of stay where you're at for a second, okay? Go ahead and stand up if you would. Grab the hand of your neighbor. We usually come down the front and dismiss. I kind of want to do it a little different tonight. I want you to grab the hand of your neighbor. You never know what's going on the right or left, do you? So what we're, doing, what we're going to do, maybe the person in front of you, behind you, I want you to pray for them, okay? I want you to pray for their, for their help, for their um, health or, or well-being or maybe whatever God leads you to pray for. Okay? But before we do that, I want you to know this. My name's Pastor Matt, and I love you guys so much. And there's so many of us that are here that are super willing to talk to you about salvation. But if it's tonight you want to submit your heart and your life, or maybe you did, it's not enough just to know we have to do it, don't we? So you invite Christ into your heart. You submit to his lordship. We want you to know that we're here to talk to you, and this is where you begin. And it's as simple as just saying, Matt, that was me tonight. What's my next step? Father, our hearts are bowed, and we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your love. And our hearts are bowed in this moment, just saying thank you for all the wonderful things. Thank you for touching our heart and changing our life, and God, allowing us to feel your spirit. Father, as we pray for the person in front of us or behind us or to the left or to the right, God, we just heap blessings upon them, heap your guidance and your love that your face would shine upon them. 
God, heal them, touch them. God, whatever they need, you know, need, you know. But God, as brothers and sisters, we just lift them up to you, God, and pray that you would move mightily in their life. Thank you for your hand in our life, God. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you for what's being done tonight, God, and what you've done all week. We claim it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everyone says...